Welcome to Willard Church of the Nazarene. We're glad you're here. We can't wait to share the service with you.
Yeah. 
I want to begin today with a question, that, and that question is, what are you waiting for? What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for something? Uh, is it a, a job? Is it a provision? Is it clarity? Is it wisdom? Are, are you waiting for healing? Are you waiting for a spouse? What are you waiting for today? I'm, I'm waiting for some things. I'm waiting for someone to make the Chicago Bears great again, right? That would be phenomenal. I'm waiting until I can get full use of my arm back, right? Like my mobility has gotten a lot better, but the strength is not there. I can't throw a ball right now. Um, three months in, and I know there's some more time that I'm going to be waiting on that. I'm praying for an answer right now to ministry, uh, something that I am seeking God's will about and his direction about, and, and I've just been asking him um, to make his way perfectly clear to me and to give me peace about that. Um, I believe one day I'll see my dad again, and I'm waiting for that day when that happens. What a joyous day that will be. What are you waiting for? What are, what are you? All of us have to endure waiting in this lifetime at some point or another. Uh, the Los Angeles Times came out with an article that added up the amount of time that the average person uh, actually spends time waiting in line for something. And their, their number kind of dumbfounded me. But the article said that you can spend up to five years of your life waiting in a line. Five years. Now, being in a rural area, I think maybe our number is probably lower than that. You know, there's not along lines at our restaurants, at our fast food places. We're not like in L.A. spending hours and hours sitting in a line of traffic, right? But we still have to deal with waiting. I, I remember when Adobe used to go to this eye specialist. She had a hole in her retina, and <laughs> she would get there early, and it was always over an hour. Right, that she would spend waiting for this eye specialist. And it was kind of frustrating, you know, uh, sitting there because you, you want to be there when you're supposed to. And yet every time it was over an hour sitting there in that waiting room. Um, if you go to Cedar Point, you're going to wait, right? And I hate that there is a fast pass because you wait even longer now if you don't buy that fast pass because everybody is just scooting ahead of you and, and passing you in line. Those are some long lines that you wait in. I always have the knack of, of picking the wrong line, whether it's in a grocery store or whether it's in a toll booth or, or whatever it is. Uh, I'm good at finding the shortest line, but the shortest line is not always the quickest line, and I just have a tendency to find those lines. Um, if you're like me, you hate waiting. But I want to show you today from God's word that when done correctly, waiting is one of the most powerful things you will do in your entire life. Would you stand with me in honor of God's word? Isaiah 64, beginning at verse 1. Oh, that you would rend the heavens and come down, that the mountains would tremble before you. 
as when fire sets twigs ablaze and causes water to boil. Come down to make your name known to your enemies and cause the nations to quake before you. For when you did awesome things that we did not expect, you came down and the mountains trembled before you. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. You come to the help of those who gladly do right, who remember your ways. This is the word of the Lord. Father, again, um, our desire is to align our lives to what your word says. So we're just asking you to make your word crystal clear to us. Make it alive in us. Father, we're asking you to use your word to change us and to transform us. Lord, Father, uh, let not one of us think that we know better, but help us to search our own hearts and compare it to what your word says and come in alignment and agreement with that. Father, we ask this in your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Verse 4 if you are a highlighter or you are an underliner, if you have a paper copy, I don't know if you probably can do it digitally, but I want you to underline that. I want you to highlight that. Verse 4, since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you. Okay, this, what we're about to hear, is unheard of to these people, right? It's unheard of to us who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Nobody's ever heard of a God who does this. Nobody's ever heard of a God like ours because he acts on behalf of those who wait upon him. Does that hit you? Does that strike you? Do you, do you get the amazingness of that? Do you grasp how crazy this is? Nobody has ever seen a God like this. It, it blows my mind that the God of the universe would act on our behalf. In our culture, there's a pecking order, right? It's the people at the bottom who work for the people at the top. But here is our God, and this says when we wait for him, he acts on our behalf. If we can deny our human nature, if we can deny our cultural bent and learn to wait upon the Lord, great things can happen, right? The church was born through waiting, wasn't it? After Jesus died and rose again, he said to the disciples, uh, he, 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 he stays with them, he eats with them, he opened their minds to the scripture, right? And in Luke 24, 49, he tells them this right before he would ascend to heaven. He said, I am going to send you what my father has promised. I'm going to do something for you. I'm going to act on your behalf, right? But stay or remain or wait in the city until you have been clothed with power from on high. Amen? On the day the church was born, Pentecost, the disciples were all together, right, waiting for what Jesus had promised. They're in an upper room. They're gathered, perhaps praying, perhaps worshiping, and the Holy Spirit comes upon them, and the church is born, right? Now, here's what's interesting they had been given the Great Commission already. They had the mission, right? They have what they're called to do. They had been had their minds opened to the scriptures. They, they know what the scripture says. They had the tools ready to that, right? Teach them to obey everything that I have commanded you. Go into all the earth, right? But he tells them to wait. Wait, hold on. There's one more thing. I wonder if I would have waited. I wonder if I would have waited for 10 days. Could you imagine that, right? Seriously, if we felt called by God to wait here in this church for something that God was going to do, how many of us would make it to 10 days? Even if we were continually going back and forth from home, right? I, I've got a job to do. I've got a lot of responsibilities. I hope he doesn't take till Friday because I really want to go to a football game and watch my son play, right, and my daughter twirl. 
There's Saturday, I want to be at home and watch college football. Sunday, I want to be home at their church and watch some NFL football. Ten days, right, waiting, would we have done it? I, I don't know, but I might have been back at work by the end of the week, you know. I got a pretty full schedule and a lot of important things to do. Let me ask you this. If the God of the universe would to impress on our hearts, hey, I want you to stay after this service and pray about something. How long would we do that? Would we do it until he moved? Or would we give it an hour, give it 30 minutes, and then be like, eh, that's enough, right? How long would we wait? How long are we prepared to wait upon the Lord? They waited. They waited 10 days, right? And untaught fishermen tax collectors and zealots ending up, ended up flipping the world upside down, right? What's the lesson? Go into all the world and, and share the good news, but wait. Why? Because we must not do what God has called us to do on our own power, pure and simple, right? On our own strength. That would be a terrible idea for us to attempt that. Let me get practical, right? The goal each week is not for you to come in here and, and hear some message and things from Scripture and then rush out of here each week and, and try to be a, a better husband, for example, or a better father on your own strength, right? That's what we try to do, though. And that's why we fail. You remember Samson after he got his hair cut off, right? And when he was woken up, he tries to, to flex. He tries to break his bonds. And those bonds stay right there where they were, right? The Spirit of the Lord had departed from him. The power had departed from him. Doing what God calls us to do on our own strength is the same thing as what Samson tried to do. A bad idea. Right? The Bible says, not by might, nor by my power, but by my spirit, says the Lord Almighty. Zechariah 4, 6b. We wait upon the Lord. We abide. We stay connected. And the spirit produces fruit through us. Real, lasting, God fruit. God produced fruit. Right? If the Holy Spirit is in our life, fruit will be produced. The real, lasting kind of fruit. We can't force it. We can't produce it. Right? That's not what the Word says. And it often comes through waiting upon Him. God is a God of seasons. Right? He's a God of sowing and reaping. It's built into the universe that he created. We need to have those seasons where God is working on us right, so that we can play a role in the harvest to come. We're often in a hurry, but God isn't. Right? We often get impatient with him because we're looking at our watch, we're looking at our time and the things that we have to do and the things we have to get done, and God isn't moving according to that. Right? It's because he has a different perspective than we do. He sees the big picture. I don't know much about gardening, but I know that when you plant something, you don't eat it the next day, right? You plant it, you weed it, you nurture it, you fertilize it, you're, there's growing and there's ripening or maturing that's involved before you eat that fruit, right? When you read this book, you're going to find over a hundred different examples, depending on the translation that you read, right, where the Bible in different ways tells us to wait upon the Lord. That's how important this is. We're told in Scripture to wait patiently. We're told to wait quietly. We're told to wait confidently, right? Scripture teaches us to wait obediently, meaning while we wait, we're doing what God calls us to do, right, has already told us to do in his word. We're told to wait with faith in our hearts, to wait eagerly. I'm hoping that today, through this time, 
that we all come away with this idea that waiting for God should never be looked at something that is a punishment, that is punitive, right? It's always preparatory. There's always work being done in this season. Waiting is never God punishing us. But that's how we see it at times, right? Sometimes we feel forgotten. Sometimes we feel like it's a curse when we have to wait for that new season or that new assignment, right? When we're waiting for that wisdom, when we're waiting for that spouse, it often feels like everybody else is getting their stuff shipped by Amazon next day, right? But we ordered something from China, and it's on a boat, and we're going to have to wait a month before it gets here. Waiting isn't punishment. It is preparation. God is preparing us for what he's organized for us, right? He won't give us something that we aren't prepared or ready to handle because he knows how harmful that would be. So often the purpose of waiting is preparation, but it can be painful, right? Rehab to get you where you need to be so that you can handle what you need to handle. That rehab is painful, but it's preparing you. It's painful, and that's why we dread it. Patience is a fruit of the Spirit, we're told, right, in Galatians 5. And so that means it's an area that the Spirit needs to grow in us. Let's be mindful of that when we are in those seasons of waiting, right? Let's ask him, what are you growing in me, Lord? What are you doing in me? What do I need to learn? What do I need to grow in? right? If this isn't moving forward like I I thought it would. Especially when we see other people are further along, other people are getting what we're praying for, and we want to be in those same positions, right? Let's not try to skip ahead of this season of preparation that God has for us, because we know that if we move forward on our own strength, what we get, what we reap will also be born of our own strength instead of his. Now, When we are waiting, we're not in control, right? So let's just be prepared for that, aware of that. Let's be prepared and aware that our natural instinct will be to try and take control, right? Waiting will make you do crazy things. I used to be a really aggressive driver. And so when I was driving down the highways, right, and I saw that sign that said merge, right, uh, because your exit's two miles ahead or it's going down to one lane, right? Probably the majority of people would soon merge at that point. But I did not want to wait in that line. And so I would be one of those people that flies down as fast as you can in that lane, right, that just magically opened up now because everybody's getting out of it. And then I would cut somebody off getting in at the end. Uh, When traffic would be backed up, right, I used to pass people on the berm to get around people. I I would be the person that was driving down the road, and you would have that on-ramp come on, right? And if there was a bunch of people lined up and traffic wasn't moving, I would get on the on-ramp just so I could pass 10 cars and go ahead of everybody, right? Waiting will make you do crazy things. In Exodus, God calls Moses to come up the mountain to him. Right? Listen to this, Exodus 24, 15 through 18. When Moses went up on the mountain, the cloud covered it, and the glory, listen to this, the glory of the Lord settled on Mount Sinai. For six days the clouds, cloud covered the mountain, and on the seventh day the Lord called to Moses from within the cloud. To the Israelites, the glory of the Lord looked like a consuming fire up on top of the mountain. Picture a mountain. Picture a a consuming fire on top of it. Know that your leader has just gone up there, right, to speak to the God. Keep that in your mind, right? Then Moses entered the cloud as he went up on the mountain, and he stayed on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. The people witnessed this. The people witnessed the glory, right, of the Lord. But Moses is up there for 40 days. Oh, my goodness, right? The next six chapters tells us what's happening. God is giving the law to him. God is giving him all this stuff to bring down to the people, right? But then we come to chapter 32, verse 1, and it says this. When the people saw that Moses was so long in coming down from the mountain, 
They gathered around Aaron and said, Come, make us gods who will go before us. As for this fellow Moses who brought us up out of Egypt, that guy, you know, we don't know what has happened to him. Can you believe it? They've been freed from slavery. They've been saved through the miracle of the Red Sea. They, they've walked through the Red Sea on dry ground, right? They've been led by a pillar of fire. God has provided for them. And they seen his glory like a fire burning on top of this mountain. And 40 days later, they're ready for new gods. They're ready to just throw it all away. We're, we're done waiting. We've waited long enough, right? Maybe this God forgot about us. Let's, let's make some new gods. Waiting will make us all do crazy things. Pentecost, I believe, is supposed to have a microcosm in our calendar every single week. It's called church, where we come corporately and wait together on the Lord. Pentecost is supposed to have this, also this microcosm in our lives every single day. It's called a quiet time where we every day approach the King of Kings and wait to hear from him, to wait upon him. We should spend time every day. We should spend corporately time at least every week gathering and listening and waiting upon the Lord. How, how are you going to decide what's worthwhile for your life, the direction for your life, for your day, if you aren't spending time with him, listening and waiting upon him? How will you hear from him if you are not in the word of God, right? I wish God would speak to me. I don't know how many times I thought that myself when I was a teenager and in my young 20s. I wish God would speak to me like he speaks to other people, but here's the thing. I wasn't listening. I wasn't even available to be spoken to because I'm out doing my own thing. I got my own stuff going on. Was I spent Spending time at his feet? No. How would I hear from him if he did listen to me? I'm doing a good job in my Bible reading right now, but I want to cultivate a time of really listening and evaluating my life and asking him to speak to my heart every day, right? Ephesians 5, 15 through 18. Be very careful then how you live. There's a warning. Are you, are you grabbing the severity of this? Right? Not as unwise, but as wise. Making the most of every opportunity because the days are evil. The days evil today? Yeah. Are you making the most of every opportunity? Hmm. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the Lord's will is. What is the Lord's will? Do you know? Because there's some scary things that are said in the scriptures if you do not know what the Lord's will is. Because that means you don't know him. And if you don't know him, he's like, depart from me. Right? Do not get drunk on wine, which leads to debauchery. Instead, be filled with the Holy Spirit. There's a call. Be filled. How does that happen? You have to abide you have to remain. You have to wait. You need to be connected to the vine, right? It's the branch life. It's John 15. That's how you get filled with the Spirit. But we're not willing to wait. Notice that it's not a call to be filled once. You don't just get saved and you get filled up one time. This is, this is a call to be regularly filled up. You leak. We leak, right? Right? We want to be continually filled by the Holy Spirit. How do you do that if you're not connected? But James, my, my life is crazy right now. I've got so many things going on. I've got all these things to do. I just can't sit there. I have to do something. Yeah, do something. Wait upon the Lord. And the Bible says, the word of God says, he will act for you. I don't know how many times I think I don't have enough time, but I make time for him. And then somehow my schedule just works out. Right? Right? That's God. Waiting can be painful, but it's nothing compared to the pain that comes from not waiting, right? Think of uh, Abraham when God told him he would have a son 
And, and he takes matters into his own hand. He had waited a decade, right? But he took matters into his own hand and has Ishmael instead of the son of promise. First Samuel chapter 13, Samuel is the prophet, Saul is the king. The nation of Israel is about to go to battle. They waited seven days for Samuel to come to them, but he's not there, and the men start to leave Saul. And so Saul panics, and he steps in and says, bring me the burnt offering, bring me the fellowship offering, and Saul offers them instead of Samuel. Saul takes the place of what Samuel should have done. And just as he's finished, Samuel arrives and says, what did you do? Right? What did you do? Well, he explained, hey, you didn't come when we thought you were supposed to come. And the men started to leave. And we felt compelled to give the burnt offering. I felt compelled to give the burnt offering. What was the result? The kingdom was taken away from Saul and given to another person. God rejected him as king. The man he gave it to was David. David David would be anointed king, and he would have to wait 13 years before he would become the actual king. Those 13 years were a season of preparation, though, a season where he learned to trust and obey God. That's all he could do. He was on the run, right? That's, God was the only person that he could depend on during that season, but what a season for him to grow in right? We often think we're out of time, but God sees the big picture and hear this, right? He has times of waiting, times of preparation built in. You're not running out of time. There's not not enough time. He knows all about time, right? And he's built it in to your lifetime to have these seasons where you wait upon him during those. What do you do in those times of waiting? Waiting is not passive, right? Waiting is not idle. What I'm about to say, um, you need to use a spirit of discernment in this because it may be true or it may not true. I'm just warning you ahead of time. But I believe the disciples made a mistake when they filled Judas's spot um, after he killed himself with Matthias. They cast lots and they brought in this, this guy to take Judas's spot. The reason I think it's a mistake is because Jesus called all the disciples, all all the 12. He specifically called those people. Jesus was the one who did it. And after he died and he rose again, who did Jesus call to be an apostle? Called Paul, right? I think Paul should have been the one to take his place. Could Could be wrong, right? But I think the 11 disciples couldn't wait. And they just had to move ahead of what God did and and made that choice to call Matthias. There's a hint of this in the writing in Galatians 1.1. Paul says this, Paul, an apostle, not of men, neither by man. He wasn't called by the disciples like Matthias was, but by Jesus Christ and God the Father. What did Matthias do? What do you know about him from the Bible when he did? I can't tell you one thing that he did. But I can tell you a whole bunch about what Paul did and who he was called to be, right? I know Jesus called him as an apostle. Uh, Here's where I'm going with this, though. Here's what I want you to see. When you read the Bible, it, it, it seems like Saul, who was Saul before Paul, right? He gets knocked off the donkey, and then all of a sudden he gets converted and he finds Christ, and then all of a sudden he's a missionary, right? An apostle to the Gentiles, who he was called to be. But it doesn't happen that fast. There's a year of waiting. There are years of waiting, 10 years of waiting from the time he was knocked off the donkey and got converted until he was actually sent to be who God called him to be. What's he doing during that time? Jesus is instructing him. Jesus is meeting with him, teaching him. He's abiding. He's fellowshipping with the other apostles, the other disciples, right? There's a season of growing. He's preaching. He's teaching. He's still doing those things that God has called him to do, right? But he hasn't stepped into the call that God has for his life because there's this season of preparation, a season of, of waiting, right? What I want you to see is, as that apostle, he didn't go directly into that. 
There was a time of waiting, a time where he didn't sit still, though, not that where we just twiddle our thumbs. It's a time to grow. And if you're in that season of waiting, let's make that the focus. Being connected to Jesus, right, and allowing the Holy Spirit to do what the Holy Spirit needs to do in our lives. After I was called to be a pastor, there was a season of preparation, right, a hard season of balancing work, going to school, right, and, and serving in the church as a, a youth leader. Um, I had to learn to balance all those things and also be a husband and a father. And that, that season um, not only taught me, but it also taught Adivy, and, and it taught my kids as well. That, that season was hard, but this season of ministry has been really hard as well. But I know without that hard season, if I would have rushed right into ministry, I would have quit, right, and bailed on that. There's no way I'd still be here today. That season was preparation. I worry that some of us are praying for something and wanting something, but we're not willing to pay for it. We're not willing to wait for it, right? Be careful with that. When you're waiting, you aren't just sitting there doing nothing, right? It's not passive. You're being prepared. Wait patiently for him. Partner with him. I, I wish we could just go to the Cedar Point Fast Pass like, and skip ahead of that. I wish we could do like the Matrix and just have that jack plugged into the back of our neck and then we know Kung Fu, right? It just doesn't work that way. It's walking with him day after day, choosing to walk with him, choosing to be in the word and letting the word, not just being in it, right? Letting the word direct our path. Letting the word change us and speak to us. Letting the word be a mirror where we see, man, I'm off in this area. I need to align myself with him. I need to keep in step with the Holy Spirit. Sometimes we feel like we're in the waiting room at a hospital or a doctor's office and we're in that room. We think that everything happens when we see the doctor and we can't wait until we can see the doctor. And sometimes those waiting rooms are long, right? But here's the thing. With Jesus, it's actually in the waiting room that we're healed. It's actually in the waiting room that we grow and are prepared because we're connected to him. Too many Christians jump out of the waiting room and they miss the preparation that's needed for the next season of their lives. Waiting stinks, right? It's, it's not fun, but it's in the waiting room that we're clothed with power from on high, right? Are you waiting on the Lord or are you trying to get out of the room because you're done waiting? Let's focus in on connecting to Jesus and being filled with the Holy Spirit. Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. Not those who wait, but those who wait for him, right? Is that you? Are you one of the people that let him determine your steps those are the ones that he acts for on behalf of. One of the, one of the biggest silver mines um, was owned by a company that tried for seven years to dig and find silver, and they found a little bit, but, they, but it wasn't enough, and so they ended up thinking that the, the mine was a bust, right? So they sold the rights to it to another country. Another, country, another company came in and began to dig deeper, spent more time digging, and that, that company was able to find veins of silver that equaled over a billion dollars. That's how much they found, right, by going deeper, by spending more time. That, that first company missed it, missed it because they weren't willing. They didn't spend enough time. Let us not be that way. Invest. Spend that time, right? I guarantee you it will pay dividends. It might take more than seven years, but it will pay dividends. Stand with me. When you examine silver that's found in a mine, it's black. You would never think if you saw it, that's what silver would look like. You would never think it was precious, but that's because it hasn't been refined. 
My friends, that's you and me. We need to be refined. And that often comes through a fire, right? Trust God in those seasons. Be careful how you look to the future. Sometimes all we can think about is reuniting someday with a loved one. All we can think about is getting to some ministry position, seeing something accomplished or or some other tangible metric of success. That's all we can focus on. That's all good. But if you focus in on that, you miss what's the most important thing. The most important thing is your time alone with Jesus Christ. That's what we need to be focused in on and not trying to move ahead to our goal. I pray that that would be a truth for each and every one of us. Amen? Father, we thank you for today. Lord, we are a culture of busyness. Lord, and sometimes we get wrapped into that and we don't have time for you and our life suffers. Our life has peace removed from it. Our life goes in our own directions according to our own will and our own strength, Lord, and that's not what you've intended for us. Father, I pray today that right now we would welcome times of waiting and we would approach those times of waiting and spend time with you. Father, I, I worry about myself when, when I don't have time for you because I feel like it's saying you're not important enough. Father, I pray that we would, we would do everything that we can to spend that time, and I pray that you would become more and more real to us all, Lord, and that you would speak to our hearts and direct our paths, Lord. Father, we just love you and we give you all praise. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.